literary critic and theorist, Professor Gayatri Spivak, drew a sizable crowd when she delivered a vice chancellor's open lecture at UCT on 27 September. Spivak, who holds the title of university professor at Columbia University in the US, spoke on the tradition of critique and feminist writing. Critical thinking, she began, requires an awareness of the subjective structures of production of the thinking. It's a rule of thumb Spivak would apply throughout her lecture to a number of texts including, cautiously, to South Africa's Women's Charter of Effective Equality of 1994 and the writings of 18th century feminist philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft. The tradition of the critique and some texts of feminism. This is how I understand the tradition of the critique by way of a polarization of critique on one side and dogma on the other. To think critically is to think only in reference to our cognitive faculties. I'm quoting the English translation of the definition given by Immanuel Kant. To think only in reference to our cognitive faculties and consequently to the subjective condition of thinking without undertaking to decide something about its object. To think dogmatically is to think something as contained under another concept of the object which constitutes a principle of reason and then determine it in conformity with this. Disciplinary philosophers in the audience will forgive me if I produce a rule of thumb translation. A critical look is to look as far as possible through an awareness of the subjective structures of production of the thinking, rather than immediately think of it as correct, connected to an object of thinking, to a seemingly pre-existing objective fact, and start developing an action. In the short run, you have to do the dogmatic bit. Not a problem, but we are sitting here at a university. And so the other, yesterday, as I was speaking to a much smaller group, um, Harry, you liked the fact that again and again, I reminded people that I could only speak in terms of a stereotype of myself, rather than simply say, look it, this is what I mean, and you must not say I mean something else. No, it is you who will understand what I mean. I cannot as much as you can. So to an extent, this comes from the tradition of the critique. Uh, so, and the, the entire thing then comes from Kant, to whom I came on my own when I was trying to write the introduction to the translation of a complex philosophical text by the Algerian French philosopher Jacques Derrida. I had had no uh, instruction in philosophy at all before then, that was when I, was, uh, I began reading Kant carefully. This was in the 70s. It was in 1992, in response to an invitation from this university, that I was pushed to think of how we, the colonial class, would use the tarnished legacy of the European Enlightenment in the aftermath of colonialism. And I'm quoting a little bit, and this is going into my forthcoming book, which if I finish proofreading, is out in January. I quote, in 1992, asked to give the first T.B. Davy Memorial Lecture at the University of Cape Town after the lifting of apartheid, I suggested that we learn to use the European Enlightenment from below. I used the expression ab use because the Latin prefix ab says much more than below indicating both motion away, okay, think all, of all of this in terms of, you put it next to use, motion away and agency, point of origin, supporting, as well as the duties of slaves. It nicely captures the double bind of the post-colonial and the metropolitan migrant regarding the Enlightenment. We want, and you know, when I say we, in general, 
if I mean the US faculty folk, I will indicate that because you know I have to code switch. This is my 46th year of full-time teaching in the United States. So sometimes that's the we, institution building we. But in general, the we that comes is this person born in British India who was the first generation of post-colonial sort of adolescents growing up. That's the we that you should hear when, I mean, and also feminism, right, a kind of proto-feminism, right? My mother was a, my mother knew how to uh, play the lati, the truncheon, and it learned from Pulindash, if that name means anything to anyone. So one of the big so-called terrorist instructors, and uh, also was a member of the All India Women's Congress, a wonderful woman. So therefore, this is the we that I mean when I say we, and sometimes something else, and I'll tell you. So, we want the uh, public sphere gains and private sphere constraints of the Enlightenment. Yet, we must also find something relating to our own history to counteract the fact that the Enlightenment came to colonizer and colonized alike through colonialism to support a destructive free trade and that top-down policy breaches of Enlightenment principles are more rule than exception. This distinguishes our efforts from the best in the modern European attempts to use the European Enlightenment critically, with which we are in sympathy enough to subvert. Now, the word sabotage means to make it uh, impossible to use. Uh, but we must give to the word sabotage a new affirmative definition. It's really to take, learn how to use, turn it around, and use it for uh, gains that perhaps were, it was not indicated for in, in initially. And that's an affirmative use of the word sabotage rather than saboter, which simply means to uh, do something so that this the thing can't be used anymore. So, but abuse can be a misleading neographism when you write it, ab use, ab hyphen use, and come to mean simply abuse. That should be so far from our intentions that I thought to sacrifice precision and range and simply say from below, use from below. But this too rankles, for it assumes that we, whoever we are, are below the level of the Enlightenment. So it's a kind of double bind, and there'll be double binds all along the way. We can talk about them. Thinking this way, you know, the, first of all, critical rather than dogmatic, and then the ab use of the Enlightenment, we can ask the question, can feminism afford the important call of the tradition of the critique? Mary Wollstonecraft and Kant were contemporaries. Kant died just short of 80, well, Stonecraft at 38 giving birth to the future Mary Shelley. If one thinks of Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of women, one inevitably thinks, and rightly so, of course, of the French Revolution, of Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man, and uh, that, uh, of the fact that these, with cultural modifications and translations, have come to stand for inalienable, inalienable human rights, and if they are inalienable, then that is natural law, isn't it? Natural law, positive law. Now, don't kill me, don't kill me. I'm trying to move into areas where I know nothing, but natural law, positive law, one can say. So at any rate, the, um, is, that's what one thinks when one reads Wollstonecraft. However, Kant, in a position where he did not have to think about making a good statement about rights, was able to see in his own way, not so much in his much lauded political writings, as this is another question that someone might want to ask me, what do you mean? Kant took such a fine anti-colonial position and you're saying not so much in his much lauded political writings, but I will say so. Kant, not so much in his much lauded political writings, but uh, as in his philo philosophical method, Having the time to do so, he could say at the end of the 18th century, when it was necessary, nascent um, um, capitalist uh, colonialism, not um, mercantile, but moving into serious stuff, right, industrial. 
So at the end of the 18th century, he, could ha he had the time to say that mere reason had to be reined in. Mere reason, that's Kant blows if announced. Mere reason, the fourth critique, had to be reined in, leading just as much to our world today, where all crisis is managed in the name of rational choice. For Kant, that is mere reason. And Kant's description of mere reason is that it is morally lazy, I quote. 